technically gets oh yeah so i'm sorry uh paul you were you were saying oh uh, we'll if anything if anything technically gets weird just let me know and i'll cut it off on my end if there's something okay. coming from my screen that's weird yeah that feel free good. feel free to intrude <laughs> awesome and we have people coming in we have uh about 20 people now which is awesome yeah if you're if you're uh coming in let us know where you're tuning in from uh let us know what brought you here this evening um and um we'll get started in a few seconds uh awesome so hello um i'm omar acevedo and i'm the literary program coordinator at the mark twain house and museum in hartford connecticut Thank you for joining us for this virtual program for Faithful Unto Death, Pet Cemeteries, Animal Graves, and Eternal Devotion. Virtual programs like this are produced in support with, in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are grateful to honor his memory with these programs. And I just wanna say a thank you to our members as well. I know there are um, at least a few of you in the audience here this evening. If you're not a member, please consider uh, supporting our museum by becoming a member. There are so many benefits to becoming a member. You will receive free or discounted admission to our author programs, the house and museum, year-round discounts in the store and cafe, and much more. Uh, please visit our website for more information or just uh, contact me and I can help you out with membership. Um, now on to our guests. Our author, Paul Kudinaris, has a PhD in art history. His previous books include Three on Death, Empire of Death, Heavenly Bodies, and Memento Mori, and one on feline history, A Cat's Tale, a Barnes & Noble Book of the Year in 2020. Uh, we also had uh, Paul for his uh, book, uh, A Cat's Tale, um, uh, you know, a few years ago. Our moderator, Lauren Rhodes, is the author of 222 Cemeteries to See Before You Die and Wish You Were Here, Adventures in Cemetery Travel. She's the editor of Death's Garden, Relationships with Cemeteries, and its sequel, Death's Garden Revisited, Personal Relationships with Cemeteries. She's written about cemeteries for Gothic Beauty, Mental Floss, Atlas Obscura, and more. Um, now, during this event, we encourage you to have a conversation with each other in the chat. If you have a specific question though, please post that directly into our Q&A section, which is on the bottom of the screen. Um, that's all from me for now. Um, please sit back and enjoy. I'll turn this over to Paul. Hi everybody and thank you Omar and hello Lauren in San Francisco. Nice to see you again. Um, we agreed that I'd start with a little bit of a ramble to try to set a little context for the discussion that we're going to have. I've been working on pet cemeteries for a real long time. You should be seeing my computer screen up there, uh, a desert pet cemetery out in Southern California. I've been working on pet cemeteries for over a decade, well over a decade, but there's one story that I have to start us out with tonight because I think it's the most important for setting up our discussion. And it's a story about a little dog named Cherry. Cherry lived a real long time ago, like he was born in the 1860s, so I mean a real old dog, and we don't know much about dogs from the 1860s individually, but we know a little bit about this guy. Someone drew a cartoon of him for the newspaper, he looks like a ragtop little Maltese guy, and we know some of the things that Cherry liked in life. Cherry, for one thing, Cherry loved the mail, he'd love the mailman. The mailman would come and and drop off the letters and Cherry would run downstairs from his in his townhouse in London, just down the street from Hyde Park, and he would pick up the mail and he'd tip, 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 run up the stairs, push it under his mama's window, his human mama, and he'd wait for his reward. She'd come out, she'd give him a pet and a kiss. And we know that Cherry, Cherry liked to play soldier. They had a little outfit for him. And he'd dress like a soldier when company came over and they'd say, Cherry, march. And he'd march around the house and they'd go, bang, Cherry die. And Cherry would roll over and play dead for the guests. But Cherry's favorite thing in the world, he loved Hyde Park just on the street. And on warm summer days, he'd go with his human brother and sister and they'd roll in the grass and they'd play fetch. His favorite thing in the world, just to spend time with his human family. Little Cherry died in 1881. And you can imagine his family was very grieved mourning this poor little dog. 
At the time in London, there wasn't much you could do with a pet that had died. You could toss it in a river. You could take it for rending, and they would shove your dog's body into a vat with broken down cows and horses and melt it into glue. They weren't. They were barely cremating people then. They certainly weren't cremating animals. So there wasn't much of an option for Cherry's broken-hearted human parents. So to show Cherry some dignity and some respect. They went to this man, his name was Mr. Winbridge, and he was the gatekeeper at Hyde Park. And knock, 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 they went to his little cottage. He lived right behind the Victoria Gate, so he could open it in the morning and close it at night. They said, Mr. Winbridge, we have a favor to ask of you. You know our little dog, Cherry, he loved you and you loved him. Can we give him a dignified burial in, in your backyard, right behind your cottage? And Mr. Winbridge was too nice of a guy to say no, so he said, okay. So they bury little Cherry, Mr. Winbridge digs him a grave, they bury him and they make him a nice little headstone that says, poor Cherry died 1881. Couple pictures, the black and white one actually shows Cherry's grave and the color one, the broken grave was where Cherry's had once stood, which means that looking at these pictures, a bunch of other people came after Cherry was buried and knock, knock, knock on Mr. Winbridge's door. They said, hey, you know, you knew, you knew our dog Prince. Well, Prince has died. And We'd like to give him a dignified burial just like you give Cherry and knock, knock, knock. You knew Fluffy and Fluffy has died and we'd like to give him a dignified burial just like Cherry and Prince. And Mr. Winbridge just kept saying yes until the in the end, his backyard turned into the world's first urban pet cemetery. 300 graves, he was burying them three deep, so nearly a thousand animals in his backyard. And it was something very different than animals buried in the ancient world. You might wonder, is this really much different, much more revolutionary than what was going on with these cat mummies in ancient Egypt? Well, the answer is yes. If you look at these cat mummies under x-ray, you'll find most of them were actually temple sacrifices. They were sacrifices to the, to the gods, not modern pets as we know them. What about Greece and Rome? There are stories of pets there. Of course, there are, there are stories about pets in, in Greece and Rome, but of all of these stories of pets, only one of them, only one of them ever got a gravestone. Her name was Helena, and she's described as an incomparable, praiseworthy soul. So what happened in Mr. Winbridge's yard really was revolutionary, this first urban pet cemetery. It was a product of the way our relationship with animals changed in the 19th century due to the Industrial Revolution. People, for the first time, were not living just on farms, the majority of people were now moving into the big cities. They were living in these metropolitan areas. And in the wake of this progress, animals were coming along. People were now living with animals in a very different way than they ever had in these new giant cities. And close in these small apartments and homes, people were living in a much closer physical proximity to animals, which in turn led to a much closer emotional proximity to animals. Basically, we invented modern pets as we know them, the way we live with them as family members on a wide societal scale, uh, the way we groom them, the way we, the way we breed them, um, the, way, the way we care for them, the way we feed them. All of that, all the trademarks of modern pet ownership date to the 19th century, and they come after the Industrial Revolution as a consequence from it. So much so that there's a, a little headline on my computer screen here preferred dogs to babies. It was an editorialist who was so upset about the about the mania for pet keeping that was emerging in the late 19th century that he was urging women to stop acting like these dogs were their children and start having children. He was like replacement theory, you know? It's like, you know, we're gonna live in planet of the dogs. You have to stop doing this. Well, humans would continue to procreate, but he was right about one thing. These animals, these pets, really were family members on a wide societal scale they had never been before, with one, let's call it grave exception. This other press clipping that I have on the screen is a story well, of- Paul, I hate to interrupt you, but we can't see the screen, the slides advancing. Oh, you can't? Oh, that's no. too bad. All right, well then, let's just say that we'll just go back to Mr. Winbridge's yard and why that is so important and revolutionary. Uh, because for the first time, for the first time, animals had the option. And an animal that lived as a family member and was loved as a family member truly had the option of being buried as a family member, a death with dignity. Oops. 
So we've, got, all... we, <laughs> we've lost your slides. Okay. Well, why don't we just do the discussion? <laughs> I'm sorry. You, you were That's you okay. flowing right along. Um, while we have Dewey here, this, this uh, particular photo turns up on Instagram pretty much like clockwork. And it seems that it always connects to people. Can you can you read it for us and tell us a little bit about who he was? Yeah. Does this slide show up on the outgoing feed? I can see it. Can somebody okay. put in the chat? Okay. Uh, it says Dewey. He was only a cat, but he was human enough to be a, a great comfort in hours of loneliness and pain. Um, it's an important image. It's it's an important image because for the first of all, historically, for the first time, someone in the United States, it's in Denton, Massachusetts, for the first time in the United States, someone left a memorial that spoke actual familial love to a cat, but it's important for another reason. In, in the terms of my book, I have an entire chapter that's that's basically based around this, this photograph and this gravestone. You know, the, the attitude had been, part of the reason it was so difficult to give a good burial to a pet was this attitude that, you know, it's only a cat, it's only a dog, without the understanding that for people who truly love these animals, they were something much more. They were truly family members. That's beautiful. Can you enlarge it for us so we can see it? Uh, well, I have it <laughs> full screen. Uh, is it getting bigger? Okay. Thank okay. you. Um, do you have a favorite epitaph that you've come across? Um, you know, there are so many. That's a hard one because, um, you know, for me, uh, I've studied so many of these. They're, they're kind of like my children. But there's one that I truly adore. And can you see this one? Is this one coming up? Yes. Okay. So this is from... You know, one of the things that's wonderful about this research was, you know, we associated it all with, with cats and dogs. But in fact, I found a grave for almost anything. Because the truth is that you can that, that you can offer love to almost any kind of animal, and many of them will reciprocate it. I found graves for as small as a fly in Maryland up to an elephant in Las Vegas. One of the most unique is this one. It's a grave for, for a trout from 1855. Uh, this man named Keddy had a stream on his property and this trout would swim in the stream and he had somehow trained this, tamed this trout and he would go out and he'd feed the fish by hand. And so when the fish wound up dead, uh, I guess he found him floating in the stream, he dug a grave for the trout and uh, this was the trout's memorial. Memory of the old fish, under the soil the old fish do lie, 20 years he lived and then did die. He was so tame, you understand, he would come and eat right out of your hand. And um, and there's a great story in addition to to Keddie's love for the trout, which is this this grave marker was kind of in it was famous in 19th century literature, you know, about animals. Like, hey, did you need it's again it's a freakish thing? Hey, did you know there was a grave for a trout? And I was determined to find this thing, to track this thing down if it still exists somewhere. And I had gone to uh, the village where Keddy had lived, and I had looked at old maps to try to figure out, you know, which house would have been Keddie's. Because I better get this right, because it's freakish enough that I'm wandering from, you know, wandering out of a village looking for a trout's grave. And I knock on this door and this, this lady answers. She kind of looks at me. She's like, yes. And I was like, hi, ma'am. I know this is a strange question. Uh, do you happen to know if uh, if there used to be a grave for a trout on your property? And she's like, looks at me very suspiciously. She's like, yes, there was. It's like, and then the, a voice comes from the other room and it's a man's voice like, uh, who is it, dear? It's like, it's uh, some gentleman's here about the trout's grave. And he says, oh, I guess you'd better bring him in. And it <laughs> turns out that they had bought the property and the trout's grave plaque was still there, very deteriorated, and they had put it in their laundry room. They'd put it in a frame in their laundry room up, up above the washing machine. So this photograph is taken in a in an English country estate la um, wa laundry room up above the washing machine where the trout's grave now lives. I love that story. Unfortunately, we've been looking at the the slide of, uh, is it a wrap? Which I know is also really important to the book too. Oh, I'm sorry, which one are you seeing? Uh, we're seeing, um, I don't know if I can read it. A wrap, okay. the dog. Arab, the dog. Okay, well, I tell you what, let's just uh, stop the screen sharing because it seems to not be working out very well. And yeah. let's just do the discussion. Okay. Um, so tell me about him. I know I know he's important to the book. 
Well, um, uh, the viewers uh, are perhaps familiar with the term cenotaph. Uh, cenotaph is a false burial site. It looks like a grave, but it's actually just a memorial. Um, and there were there have been a couple famous ones. Uh, as you know, uh, the dog that played Toto in The Wizard of Oz it has a cenotaph, a fake burial site at, at Hollywood Memorial Cemetery. Um, he was that dog. It was actually she was buried under the at her trainer's home, and eventually the they built the Hollywood Freeway over it, and uh, and so her grave was irretrievable. But they built a cenotaph for it at Hollywood at the, the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. But my favorite burial is that one that apparently you've been looking at while I have been unfortunately talking about the trout um, for a dog named Arab um, in a pet cemetery just west of Chicago. And it's a, it's a very touching story, actually. Um, that pet cemetery is the oldest surviving pet cemetery in Illinois. And it survived only because it was saved by a Russian immigrant. And you may ask why. Why does the Russian immigrant want to come over and and save a failed pet cemetery. And the reason is because uh, this man in during the Bolshev Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, his family was kind of on the hit list. They were considered enemies of the, the new state. And they knew the soldiers would be coming for them. And um, one night their dog, Arab, started to bark out an alarm. And they looked out and saw the soldiers coming. Arab had tipped them off. You know, people are coming. You got to get out of here. So his family turned to leave as they were, they were going to try to run west and then escape through Europe and eventually immigrate somewhere. And Arab had given them the alarm. And when they turned to look, they saw their dog Arab was not following them. Their dog had stopped to engage those soldiers to buy his humans as much time as they could possibly mm -hmm. get to escape. They did escape and they were forced to hear the gunshot that ended their faithful dog's life. And that is why a Russian immigrant when he arrived in Chicago, would purchase a failing cemetery so he could build a memorial to that dog and write on the side of it, he gave his life so that a human may live. No greater love hath any man. Gives me goosebumps. It's so, an incredible story. It is. It really is. Um, uh, I don't know how you segue out of that into my questions. Uh, <laughs> do you, Could you tell us about the first pet cemetery that you ever went to? The first pet cemetery I ever went to, um, well, okay, so the first cemetery that inspired this book was the one in Carson slash Gardena, California. The civic lines are a little a little dicey, and we won't get into the geography of it. But uh, I had finished a book called Memento Mori, and it was the third and last of my death books. So, And this was before it was published. I had just turned in the, the manuscripts. It was probably like 12 years ago, and a friend of mine suggested... Um, you know, have you ever checked out that pet cemetery down down the freeway? You know, it's a, it's a very interesting place. You might want to maybe get some good photos out of it. And I went down there with my camera one day and I had already written three books about death and thought that I was invincible, you know, absolutely imp impervious of heart. And this place got me, you know, as I started, I looked at my camera and saw these little drops of water and I was like, oh, now it's starting to rain You know, I better finish up. And then I looked at the sky and there was no rain. I had been walking around reading all these little headstones, you know, that that are the thing about that I love about pet cemeteries, they're so personal, you know, it's like with with the human dead, there is a standard rhetoric, we have to show this certain kind of respect, and you can write anything you want in a pet cemetery, there's nothing inappropriate. It's, it's very seldom elegant, but um, it's always touching, and it's always straight from the heart, and they had gotten me, you know, and I realized then it's like those little drops of water were coming from me, and it's like, Okay, there's something here. But the first pet cemetery I ever visited, actually, when I was a kid, my grandparents lived out in a town called Desert Hot Springs, California. And Desert Hot Springs has a pet cemetery, and actually it has some great burials there. All Liberace's dogs are buried there, for instance. Um, I have a great story I can share about one of Liberace's dogs, too, in that cemetery. But um the, the Desert Hot Springs Pet Cemetery really looks like the kind, it's like a desert version of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. It's like, you know, it's got like a little trailer on the prop because, well, because it's just, if you know Desert Hot Springs, um, there were a lot of people breaking in and trying to steal things. So it's got a trailer there with a guy living in it. Everything's always covered in sand. Anything they try to plant out there dies. You know, it's like, I remember driving by that place all the time and thinking, it's like, God, these, these pets, was I a kid? You know, it's like, uh, these pet cemeteries are really scary places. Um, it turned out they were actually really lovely places. All right, now I have to ask about Liberace's dogs. Okay, okay. So this is not in the book because the owner of the pet cemetery in Desert Hot Springs asked me to please not tell this story. 
Um, he insists it's not true. Other people have assured me it's true. You can believe what you want. Liberace had several poodles. He loved his poodles. And he had buried them all there because Liberace, remember, he lived in Palm Springs. He had the house in Palm Springs. And so Desert Hot Springs was right across the highway. So it was the nearest place. And the story is that he had a poodle named Prego. And Prego's grave is in the book. Uh, he had a poodle named Prego. And Prego was famed for wearing a diamond studded collar. Of course, this is Liberace. And so they buried Prego. And apparently, um, a week or so after they buried Prego, someone comes to the cemetery and they find the grave dug up. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, you know, right. the tweet. Oh, sorry if you live in Desert Hot Springs. It's the tweakers. And they were looking for, they're looking for the diamond studded collar. But the thing that's so fascinating about this is um, they, they rebury Prego. And a couple weeks later, Prego's dug up again. Rebury, and a couple weeks later, Prego's dug up, dug up again because someone just couldn't get it through their head. It's like, okay, guys, wait. If Prego wasn't wearing the collar the first time he was buried, he's probably not wearing it the second and third time mm. he's buried. I tried to track down the collar, too. Interesting thing about that. Liberace had made it very clear in the newspaper on Prego's death that he was not bearing Prego with the collar. He had stated that to a newspaper reporter. And he said he was donating it to a museum in Palm Springs. But I checked every museum in Palm Springs, and it never appeared on an intake sheet. So someone did steal Prego's collar, just mm -hmm. not from the cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've been to Pet's Rest out here in Colma. But uh, one of yeah, yeah. Tina Turner's dogs is buried in yeah, yeah. her coat, but it's an unmarked grave because they didn't want people digging it up to get the coat. And this is something that um, happens a lot at the Los Angeles Memorial Pet Cemetery because it is the pet cemetery of the stars. And so some very famous names uh, did not mark their pet's grave for, for that reason, I think. Um, uh, Mae West, for instance, buried her her given there but the grave is unmarked and there were several others like that uh in in chapter four of my book i talk about that cemetery in particular and there was a grave of a very famous cat he was the second famous movie cat his name was puzzums and his gravestone disappeared so apparently someone stole that gravestone so there was a good reason i think for the celebrities to not mark their graves do you know of any time when um Somebody's pet, somebody's pet has been dug up and held for ransom. Have you heard anything about that? No. Not to be you. totally gruesome, but <laughs> no, no. I, I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> is, if that's a leading question. Please tell me. No, no, no. Oh. I, I don't know anything about it either. But I know. <laughs> people are going after collars. It seems like you can't trust them to, do, you know, have any sort of morals. Um. I guess that's a good place to segue to. Uh, the monuments in pet cemeteries tend to be yeah. really unusual and interesting. Um, have you have you seen any handmade monuments that really spoke to you, or monuments in general? Well, yeah, and uh, I'm not going to risk going back into the slideshow at this point. <laughs> it's uh, sorry. But it's okay. It's okay. But the book has plenty of them. Um, so my favorite type of pet cemetery, there's really two different types. You know, there are the kind of pet cemeteries that mimic a human cemetery and they look like a miniature version of the human cemetery. Those are the kinds we're most familiar with. You know, uh, the first one in the United States is like that Hartsdale. Um, the one in Mr. Winbridge's yard where I started is like that. The one in Paris is like that. But then there's another kind, the kind of off the grid, do it yourself pet cemetery. It's like a gigantic version of someone's backyard pet cemetery. And they're extremely dominant, especially in the American West, in the desert areas, in, in California, uh, Nevada, Arizona, Colorado. You'll find a lot of these places out in the desert where it's just a huge expanse of public land and people bury their pets for free. Um, and everything is kept up by the owners or not kept up at all. And uh, that's where I find my favorites because, you know, everything is by hand. It's like the outsider, it's like the outsider art version of mourning or something you know because everything's handmade and it's people who are looking through whatever means they have for some way to express that loss um uh, i found several graves out in the desert where people have planted mailboxes over over their pet's grave mm -hmm. so they can leave letters for the pet you know uh, so they can leave letters or treats or just messages for the pet um uh in ajo arizona the great pet cemetery of this kind in Ajo, Arizona. And uh, someone 
pulled loose a fire hydrant from a city street. I guess it was the fire hydrant his dog liked to piss on. And he took it out to the desert and buried his dog under that fire hydrant. I've seen entire crosses made of uh, tennis balls, you know, just saved up mm -hmm. from from ones the dogs have played with. And I've seen some others where um, in Boulder City, there's a Boulder, Boulder City, Nevada, there's a, a huge one of these pet cemeteries. And um, there was one great grave where they had um, in, enclosed it like a little dog's running yard and um, with a little dog house in it. And the whole thing is just filled with empty beer bottles because <laughs> the guy was going out there and getting drunk with his dog, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I and I find those I find those lovely. Um one of my one of my favorites also, um, it doesn't have quite the rough nature of the American desert pet cemeteries, but there are so many like this. The one in Helsinki, Finland is one of my favorites because it looks like a pet cemetery from the Lord of the Rings. It's like um, you know, it's out in the woods. And um the tradition there is to to get a a nice piece of wood, you know, a flat piece of wood, flat and um hand paint a picture of the pet with like a mm -hmm. hand painted message and they all have these little lights next to them you know with like the bat solar batteries and so if you go there at night it just the whole thing starts to light up you know and you're walking through the woods with these beautifully painted pictures of the animals and uh you know and walking through with the little lights guiding your way it's, it's absolutely beautiful um there is um there's, it's funny because, you know, as much as I traveled, because I've, I've gone to Africa, I've gone to Asia, I've gone to South America taking pictures of pet cemeteries and researching this stuff. And um, you see, you see the same traditions popping up in different places, just in different ways. So the pet cemetery in Juarez, Mexico is another one of my favorites. And it's actually, you know, it's, it's the same tradition that you find in Finland. It's just that in, it's a desert landscape. And instead of painting on wooden boards, they're painting on rocks, but it's the same thing, you know, hand painted depictions of the pets with hand painted images, with hand painted messages from the owners. Uh, and again, it's it's lovely. It's that handmade touch that really gets me more than, you know, more than the pre-made headstones. That's what I think of. I mean, that's the pet cemeteries out here are a lot of handmade markers uh, yeah. you ended the book with the one in the presidio which is one of my favorites under the, the one in the presidio yeah though she is so for those who don't know she's talking about the san francisco presidio the old army base yeah. and um yeah i ended the book with that because so many have been destroyed and that one was actually rebuilt but i must correct you i did not end the book with the presidio oh i'm sorry it's oh, in no, hold on, no. no because hold on no because if you flip to the very, very last page, the very end, like what, which nobody does because it's the end of the index, you'll find one last picture. And that is a picture of my own cat's grave in Winter Haven, California at one of those desert pet cemeteries. So right. it was important. That it was, it was important. Yeah. That's her. Her name was Tika. And that is her grave in Winter Haven, California. It was important for me. You know, at the end when we were talking about the book, I, I, told the I talked to the designer and the editor I was like hey how much pay, how much space is left in that last page They're like it's a little bit it's like just get this photo in there because there's no dedication of the book but now there is you know because it's really it's dedicated to her memory and her grave which got washed away in a flood well, I was going to ask where your pets were well, she, okay, so she's with me now. Well, not with me now. I'm in a hotel room in Reno. Um, that would be even more perverse. But um, she's, uh, um, because the state of California decided to steal some river water and they wound up uh, diverting a bunch of it over the pet cemetery. Mm -hmm. So when her original grave marker got washed away, by that time she had been out there long enough that that she was nothing but bone. So I exhumed her skull and that I have it. And I took her grave straight back with me. Oh, that's sweet. Um, I was going to ask you about the Rainbow Bridge because I I think that's the thing that most people think of. You know, when a pet dies, yeah, somebody will email you that. Where yeah. did that come from? Okay, so um, this is a fascinating story. Um, I will try to tell it in brief as much as possible because. No one had ever known who wrote the Rainbow Bridge. It was one of those mysterious things. It may be, it may be the most reproduced morning, we'll call it a prose poem, maybe. It may be the most reproduced piece of morning literature, a morning prose poem 
ever written. Uh, for those who don't know the Rainbow Bridge, it prophesies a place um, where you and your pet will meet up again and they will cross this bridge and, and wander off into eternity for get to forever in each other's company. No one know who wrote that. There have been academic essays written about the Rainbow Bridge and they talk about, you know, it's like, okay, well, it's someone who's familiar with uh, North, Norse mythology because it's got the bridge and then the rainbow, they're obviously talking about no one picking out all these metaphors. It's like, I cannot, I need a name. I cannot write a book about pet cemeteries and not at least attribute that to someone. And so I worked on this for a real long time. And I would keep going back to that Rainbow Bridge and never find an answer. And eventually it turned into one of those things like you see on like a TV detective show with like I had a board with names, like crossing <laughs> things out because I was doing detective work. And I had crossed out everyone who could have possibly written this. And there was one name that I had come up with. And um, a, an old Scottish lady uh, she's in her 80s now. Her name's Edna Klein Recky. And the name I had gotten somewhere on the internet, but the name was misspelled, which made it even worse. And I was like, everyone else had, there were people who tried to copyright it and steal this thing as their own and publish versions of it. And it was like, I could cross them all off because I knew it was, I could tell from my detective work, it wasn't that person. And there was this one person left. And like I said, her name, I had found her name on the internet somewhere and her name was misspelled. And I started looking up variations of this name and I found a book that had been written about um, a lost dog that she had found in her washing machine and adopted. And I was like, this is a very kind hearted woman. And I tracked her down in Scotland and, um, and wrote to her. And I was like, yeah, I got in contact with her. I was like, are, are you the, the author of the Rainbow Bridge? And her response was, how on earth did you find me? <laughs> and she turned out to be the most special person. I got the first interview that she has ever given. given. Oh. And she is truly the most special person. The story behind the Rainbow Bridge is fascinating because she wrote it when she was only a teenager and her dog named Major had died. And she uh, felt, she told me she felt Major speaking through her. She pulled a piece of paper out from a notebook and started scribbling on it. And she showed me the original text of the Rainbow Bridge. She's wonderful. And she's got a box in her attic that says, if you can't find it, it's in here. And it's in that box. And uh, that's where she keeps the original manuscript of the Rainbow Bridge. It's on two sides of a piece of paper. There are hardly any corrections to it. She wrote it. She wrote it almost exactly as it appears now. Granted, there are different variations as it's passed through hands. Um, but she told me that she felt her dog speaking to her and telling her what to write. You know, this prophecy of where they were going to meet again and how this was going to happen. And um, she never knew that the Rainbow Bridge had become as big as it did. Uh, because she wound up marrying a physician from India. So she has spent a lot of her life living in India. And then after he retired, they bought an olive farm in rural Spain. So she was living in India and rural Spain. So she had no idea that the Rainbow Bridge was this international phenomenon um, until I contacted her and really started to talk to her. And I remember I told her, it's like, Edna, are you aware that Dear Abby shared the Rainbow Bridge, the text of the Rainbow Bridge, with 100 million readers in the mm -hmm. United States? That's how it became so big in the United States, because Dear Abby shared it in her column twice. And her only response was, who's Dear Abby? Because you know, she doesn't know. <laughs> she doesn't know, because she had been living, you know. She had been living in these places and then eventually her husband got Alzheimer's. She moved back to Scotland and she kind of, she, it, it, she said, you know, it kind of occurred to me that somehow the thing I had written had gotten around. But um, so I published this article about it because it was far more than the book needed. I just needed an attribution. I wound up uh, publishing an article about it. And this is a great story. So I published this article and the article itself started to make the rounds. You know, it's like National Geographic picked it up and the BBC did something because this is actually big, you know, because this has comforted so many people. And um, she still has dogs. She has two dogs, one of them, which has this cute little rescue who tells her when it's time to go to bed and brings her slippers to go upstairs and so forth. And um, and she told me she went to her vet's office because she says, dog. and her vet had read the article I had written and her vet walks into the office and he says, Edna, did you write the Rainbow Bridge? And she's like, yes. And he's like, okay, for, for like two decades, when someone's <laughs> pet has died, I've handed them a copy of the Rainbow Bridge without having any idea that one of my clients wrote it. So he Xeroxed a copy of the Rainbow Bridge and had her autograph it for the office. Oh. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting story.
that was one of my favorite bits of the book because you know that's it's so ubiquitous to, to it actually is. know who's behind well, it. Yeah, and and so you find so the thing with the Rainbow Bridge, because I really had to explain to Edna how it functions and why it has gotten so big. Um, we've always had a problem in Western culture. If this book had 10,000 more words, I would have written a, a chapter about animals and spirituality because we've always had this problem in Western culture with this idea that it's like, you know, humans are number one and animals are, are lesser. You know, we're in God's image and what does that make them? I don't know. They're just stuck in the Garden of Eden and, um, and we kind of spoiled it for them, but we get to go to heaven and they don't or something. And that's bad theology. If you really get into the theology, um, you'll find out that's completely false. This idea that animals don't have a soul. In, early, in the early Christian days, the argument was not whether an animal had a soul or not. The argument was simply whether they had a soul that was the same as we do, mm -hmm. not whether they had one or not. There was no reason to exclude them from heaven. But bad theology later through Christian history has kind of kept them on the outs. The beautiful thing about the Rainbow Bridge is that it kind of serves as a theological plug-in because it is so, because it was written by this teenage girl in grief with her, you know, the voice of her dog telling her what to do, it is so incredibly perfectly vague that you can plug it into whatever your theological system is without creating um, without creating a, a form of heresy. So, you know, whether you're, whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant or whether you're a Wiccan or a pagan or whatever you are, you can plug the rainbow bridge because it's not actually contradicting anything in theology. It's just telling you that at the end, before you get to paradise, whatever that paradise is, you will meet your pet again and you will walk with them over the bridge to eternity. So it's given this comfort for a lot of people who have been brought up with the idea that somehow they will not meet their pet in the afterlife. Right. It's given them a form of hope. That's beautiful. So it sounds like you've got enough stuff for a second book. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen, I spent like 12 years working on this. Okay. Um, and these illustrate, you, you know, cause you, you, you do illustrated books. Your cemetery book is a highly illustrated book. You do an illustrated book. You're in it throughout. I'm, I took every photo in that book. I hunted down all these archival images. Um, I'm in it until the end of design. So it's, it's, and plus you're working on pet cemeteries. Okay. So, Every day when I'm working on this book, I am reliving someone's grief on their animal's passing. I spent a year as a, a volunteer grief counselor for people whose pets had died while I was working on this book because I understand the loss from my perspective. I need to understand it from other people's perspective. You know, it's like so, so emotionally, my God, I cannot approach. I could never okay. do part two of this. Thank <laughs> you. No, no, no. I have some extra stories and I thought of maybe doing some one-offs or, you know, filtering them out somewhere, but I'm not, I'm not doing faithful unto death part two, the return, you know, that okay. that's like, a, that's a zombie. That's an animal zombie movie. That needs to be made. <laughs> well, I, I'm fascinated to hear you talk about the, the Juarez cemetery and, and the pet cemeteries outside uh, Western Europe. It seems like most of these are European or uh, well, American. Not necessarily. Well, okay. So the United States, because we are so great at creating commodity, has more than the rest of the world combined. We've really got a lot of them because we have managed to create special kinds of pet cemeteries. You know, there's a special cemetery in Alabama just for, for raccoon hunting hounds. Uh, you know, there's a bird dog cemetery in Georgia. There are police dog cemeteries and so forth. So we've really got this vast panoply. Uh, but like, you know, uh, I found this beautiful pet cemetery in Bolivia where they specialize in these kind of glass memorial dog houses for dogs that have passed with these little mannequins of the dog in them. Um, you know, in, um, in Indonesia, I visited this wonderful little pet cemetery in Bali and was even allowed to participate in a, um, a Hindu funeral for a dog. So it's, it's really, it's everywhere now because, you know, it's one thing that is different as we are. The one thing that has become universal since Cherry's burial, the one thing that really did spark was this idea around the world that in this ideal, that an animal that has been loved like a family member deserves that same respect, dignity, and love at death. That is something that is truly universal, no matter how different we are, no matter where we are. There are just variations of it all throughout the world. There are variations of how that's done, but that is now worldwide. 
Oh, that's cool. Um, I was going to ask you about uh, like the Kentucky Horse Park and the Coon Dog Cemeteries. Um, sure. This, those the are specialty work- ones. Yeah, those are working animals. Um, I, w- I was interested that you left those out, but you put in the... Uh, well, the Coon Dog Cemetery is in the book. I, there's a photograph, I think. Yeah, I, I mention it. There's only so much I can do. in. No, of course, you can't have everything. But And, you know, people come to me and say, why'd you leave your the, my favorite cemetery out of your book? Because, you know, the book has to be a certain size. But people right. have told me that the Coon Dog Cemetery is really, really affecting. It, it is because um, the, the Coon Dog Cemetery. Um, so if, if you know what a Coon Dog is, you're an American. And you you probably spent time in the South, and let's not assume everyone is. So uh, what they mean by a coon dog is a raccoon hunting hound. It's a special kind of hound that there is some debate as to whether or not they constitute their own individual breed. Uh, but it's a special kind of hound that's that its specialty is terrorizing raccoons and chasing them up in a tree. That's what it's really good at. That's what it's bred for. And... Um, so the, in Alabama, there's this wonderful little cemetery for raccoon hunting hounds. It's been around for, for several decades. And you have to prove that your dog was a coon dog. That You know, you have to get like, you know, you're supposed to provide, if, if you're not a familiar person to them, you know, you're supposed to provide some kind of information to confirm that your dog was a coon hound. There's a, a wonderful story about um, an old lady who lived in Alabama whose dog had died and she didn't know what to do with it and she just wanted to give it a burial. So she just took it and buried it in the coon dog cemetery. And they're like, ah, uh, lady, you know, you're you're a really, you're a really nice old lady and we we, we like you and, and I'm sure your dog was great, but this is for a special kind of hunting dog and you're a little cocker spaniel he can't be we will help you find a grave for your dog we'll help you pay due respects for him but this is terra sancta this is holy ground right now for raccoon hunters this this little dog can't be here but it's an <laughs> it's another one of those um it's another one of those cemeteries where a lot a lot of the graves are homemade um you know, it it varies there because some people, because you know, these people take their dogs very seriously. Some people will will spend the money for an expensive memorial. Some people will just hand make a plaque or something. My favorite one there uh, was a little plaque that was, uh, it's on a piece of metal, and someone like cut the letters out by hand, and it says he was as good as the best. He was as good as the best and better than the rest. Okay. Which I think, if you put that down, I think it just means he's a good dog. Mm-hmm. But it's a, it's a great way of saying it. Yeah, there's some very affecting gravestones there. Maybe that's a good place to to end it. Okay. Open it up for questions. I don't know, Omar. Did I haven't been following the chat? Do we have some questions in the in the chat? Well, I don't know because I don't know where the chat is. Yeah. Um, can I, you I read haven't it? been watching it because it flickers too fast for me to keep up. Well, we'll just have to keep talking. Um, do we have some some questions there? Um, looks like we only have one. Okay. Looks like it's a maybe a more of a comment. Mm-hmm. Um, Kate says, "I live in Connecticut and want my remains remains to be buried with my cat's ashes in a cemetery, and I want all of us to be listed on a stone." When I asked yeah. a local funeral director where all of our ashes could be legitimately buried together with all of us listed, she says she would ask the Funeral Directors Association. The ultimate reply was, hmm? I can take this question. I already know where we're going. Okay. Um, You tell Kate, so Kate, hi. Um, You can be buried with your pets in a pet cemetery. Um, Not every pet cemetery allows this service. It depends, you know, the United States is a vast and complex series of overlapping legal systems, right? And different municipalities. Um, In New York, for sure you can. You can go to Hartsdale Pet Cemetery in New York, the oldest pet cemetery in the country, and they will bury your ashes. It has to be cremated ashes. Um, 
you they'll bury your ashes with your cats in your pet cemetery. There are several burials like that in that pet cemetery, and several others do allow that. It just it's a matter of what the jurisdictions will allow. But generally, you know, once you have been cremated, you're no longer considered human remains. That's why people are allowed to go out and spread. You know, people are allowed to go out into the desert or whatever and spread ashes. They can't go out into the desert with a corpse and chop it into pieces and throw it around. You know, but you can spread the ashes because it's no longer really considered human remains. So uh, in several pet cemeteries, you can. The caveat is pet cemeteries are not allowed to advertise the service in most places. And the reason they're not allowed to advertise, I suspect, has something to do with the funeral industry itself. The funeral industry is a big industry, and they probably don't like this competition from people who could tell you, yeah, you know what? you liked your pet more than your relatives. You just want to be buried with them cheap. You can put your ashes in this grave. Um, so there are several people at Hartsdale, um, ashes of people, and several at several other pet cemeteries. But for Connecticut, that would probably be the closest option would be Hartsdale um, in Hartsdale, New York. Uh, I have a great story. Um, Lauren, can I give you uh, a great story Please. about a person's ashes in a pet cemetery? Please. And I will not, I'm not going to reveal which pet cemetery this was. It's not that what happened isn't their fault, but I think they just would prefer not to be associated with a weird scandal. So a very wealthy guy wanted to be buried with his cats. And he had written it into his will. He had a monument made for his cats and his cats were already dead and they were in the pet cemetery. And it was agreed in his will that his ashes would be turned over to the pet cemetery for burial. And he dies. And so he dies. And his, his sister turned over ashes to the pet cemetery and they they buried them with the cats. About a year later, they get a call from the guy's attorney who was his estate attorney. And the attorney says, hey, I've been waiting for you guys to contact me to get this guy's ashes to bury him with his cats. That was in his will. I was like, <laughs> they said, well, um, we've already done it. They're like, no, you haven't. I have the ashes. Like, well, we got them from his sister. It's like, no, he, di he didn't even talk to his sister. He doesn't like his sister. I don't know whose ashes you have. But that's not his ashes. So they contacted the sister and she said, I, I don't know. I thought those were his ashes. So they wound up getting the other package of ashes from the lawyer. And, um, and they buried those with the cats too. So you've got, you've <laughs> so got covered. You've got four cats and two people, one of whom is a stranger down there in a, in a grave in a pet cemetery and the you know the other guy who's down there is probably like you know he's waking up in the afterlife wait, wait who are you i'm allergic to cats who are you what's going on but yes <laughs> yes that's it it's, um so some mysterious person is buried with this guy and his cats yikes angela wanted me to ask yes what's your favorite cemetery or failing that, where's where's the cemetery? If you if you're only going to visit one pet cemetery, where should you start? Oh, <laughs> on the spot. Okay, okay, okay. So now, well, it's hard because you have to realize that for me, it's not just a question of the place; it's a question of my experience of the place. You know, everything that goes into getting there and being there, and the people I meet along the way. It's a hard one. Um, if you are just going to visit one pet cemetery, visit the one in Paris. It is kind of the great grandfather of all the elegant pet cemeteries. You know, there's so much history there, some very famous burials, uh, although not the most famous burial that people think. That's in my book, too. Uh, there's a grave for Rin Tin Tin, and as I reveal at the end of my book, they've got the wrong dog in that grave, but that's another story. Um, the, the pet cemetery in Paris is truly spectacular. I wouldn't call it my favorite. Uh, I already went on about the one in Helsinki, which I think looks like you know, it looks like Pet Cemetery from the Lord of the Rings. If you really want to be emotionally moved, I'd say go to a Pet Cemetery like that. Or if you really just want the full experience of this vast panoply of pet ownership and how it fits into people's lives in all these quirky, wonderful, loving, and insane ways, just go to one of those big desert pet cemeteries and walk mm -hmm. around and look at look at the crosses made of tennis balls and look at the look at the uh, mailboxes on poles with letters to people's dogs in them. But if you're only really, really decided you're only going to visit one, I guess go to Paris. <laughs> going to Paris isn't a bad option. That's no, I'm saying no, it like that's no, a that's, that's a punishment. Good excuse go to go to Paris. Paris. You bastard, go to Paris. How is it easy to get there? If you have to take a boat, no, it's not okay, an so island, the, right? 
Yeah, well, okay. So that's a, that's a, thank you for bringing that up. So the Pet Cemetery in Paris actually started, it, there are a couple interesting things about it. Uh, it was on an island in the Seine. Um, and it, the Pet Cemetery in Paris was the first one that was designed truly as a public pet cemetery, because all the ones before it were really kind of, they were open potentially to the public, but the pets of Paris Pet Cemetery was a truly public pet cemetery because they even included a kind of potter's field for the pets of poor people. So they really wanted to address this universal problem across all levels of society in Paris of, of pet deaths. Um, and it was on an island in the Seine, and they had the people who founded it had an actual business plan for it. I mean, they had thought the whole thing out. They were selling shares in like the, the pet cemetery company, um, even though it wasn't really for profit, you know, so they could raise enough money so they could get an architect involved and sculptors involved designing the grant. So they really made it look kind of like a miniature version of like Père Lachaise, but for pets or something. And um, but that island eventually got silted in. So mm. uh, it is no longer an I was originally an island in the river, but it's no longer an island anymore. Okay. You can just park your car and walk over to it. But yes, it technically. Good, um, I'm glad I asked. They, they called it because it's Cemetery des Chiens or Cemetery of the Dogs, and they, it was on the the Ile de la Chiens, you know, the Island of the Dogs, because mm -hmm. that's what it was after they bought it. They renamed it the Island of the Dogs. Cool. Thank you. Well, a couple of people have mentioned your um, your work finding the animals dead in the desert the the oh, road yes. and the other animals um could you talk a little bit about that yeah um that's a little bit of a transition for people who aren't familiar with i it. know i'm um, sorry yeah no 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 I, i'm just i'm trying to find find a way to transit into this um uh, so I, I i can't really call it a hobby it's really not a hobby it's um pursuit of um of dignity and death, I guess, that uh, oftentimes, you know, I travel around the desert a lot. I live in the desert and I've lived out in the desert for quite a few years now. And when I find, especially pets that have been abandoned, because it's quite common out here and left to die or, or animals that have been killed out in the desert, I'll, I'll make roadside memorials for them. I'll photograph them to try to give them some kind of, um, some kind of fitting end, you know, some kind of death with dignity or some kind of decent end because you know they have no oral culture the only the only trace that this animal this this beautiful animal that had love to give and, and it, the only trace that it was ever among us was its physical presence and so i like to try to give that physical presence one last aspect of dignity and, and give it some kind of loving memorial photo you know that, that can be shared to just say it's like hey you know this this beautiful creature was on once among us, and let's be reminded that this this creature once once walked the earth, you know, because it's going it's going to fade into the dirt now. It's going to be forgotten, um, but you know it deserves it deserves something better than to die out here in the hot sand. This book for me, um, this pet cemetery book, it's it's really it's really not just a book. It's kind of like spreading the gospel for me because it's something that I believe very, very deeply that these animals deserve, that, that in life, they deserve love and dignity and they deserve that at the end too. So when I, you know, I've been doing, I just did something like eight talks in nine days and, and someone asked me, it's like, how do you, how do you get it together to just keep doing these talks every night in cities 400 miles apart? And I told them, because this is, for me, this is a gospel. I'm preaching a gospel because it's something I, I very fervently believe in. I absolutely, that they deserve this dignity, that if they have given love and they have been loved, at the end, they must have love. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful way to end the talk. Um, I guess we have one, one final question I, I like because it, it, kind of segues us into the future is do you yeah. have any research projects in the works well yeah i need to take a nap for like about two oh, years sure. maybe and then we'll rest your <laughs> then voice we'll figure out, yeah no um i do actually well there's something that i started working on quite some time ago it's a work that's half of fiction and well more than i'd say 99 percent of fiction let's put it that way and one percent of fact but Several years ago, uh, I had traveled up to Fresno, California, and I visited the Cat House on the Kings, which if you're not familiar with it, it's the largest cat rescue in the country. They've got they've got over a thousand cats there on this property where they're just the cats are allowed to run around free range, and they've got a section for the senior cats. And there was this 
old cat. I sat down in the senior room because I always visit the senior room because I love the senior cats. And this cat was just huffing and puffing like Darth Vader. And he had this tumor growing out of his leg and he looked like absolute hell. And he comes stumbling across the room and just falls in my lap, wanting nothing but love and nothing but pets. And he was the most adorable, loving little creature. And his name was Walter. And I became good friends with this cat. I used to drive up to Fresno just to visit this cat. When he died, I was the one who paid for his grave, you know, and um, helped. And in fact, um, I helped them raise some money um, for Walter to pay for his vet bills while he was alive and then during the pandemic after he was dead i went into uh, an animal shelter in san bernardino california and i found a, a little gray kitten that reminded me so much of the original walter that i had loved the old cat because i couldn't adopt this cat my lifestyle is much too chaotic to have a special needs cat at home you know so i would you know he had to live at the shelter and so i adopted this cat because he reminded me so much of the little the original walter and then my walter became this adventure cat like i'd go out in the desert and he'd ride with me in the jeep and he'd do all these things and um and so it occurred to me that maybe you know, because I had obviously adopted, get, named my Walter after the original one because he reminded me of him in the first place. And it occurred to me, it's like, maybe my Walter is in the process of showing me the adventures of the original Walter. You know, and so I came up with the idea for a kind of book of fiction. It would start with me meeting the original Walter, you know, because this much is true. But then this this other Walter, you know, the original Walter kind of... Um, he talks to me and he tells me he wants to tell me the story of his many lives. And so, you know, it's like the original Walter and his many adventures and many different lives, you know, which my cat is kind of kind of living out. And in the book, they would be much more grand. You know, he'd be a pirate on a ship and, you know, he'd be flying in a plane and doing these things. And then in the very end of the book, so, so obviously that part's fiction, I hope. Um, I don't want my cat. <laughs> I don't want my cat trying to pilot. Uh, but then in the end of the book, you know, it was like it would come back to me with the original Walter and the original Walter would be asking me to, you know, he's decided he, this is it for me. like, he's obviously dying and he's not coming back this time. And he wants mm -hmm. me to walk with him to the end. And then it occurs to me, the reason this cat has chosen me through all, you know, is because I have been there for all of his adventures that as this cat has been reincarnated, I have also been reincarnated as, as characters within these many lives. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know? So, so some, I'll eventually get back to that. That's lovely. Uh, I saw a couple more questions, I think, pop on the screen. Omar, did we have some questions that popped up? Oh, muted. Or I can't hear you anyway. You know? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Mm, no. Um. Uh, Hi. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, wireless technology. Um, I don't see anything. I think we might have addressed all the questions. Um, there have been some comments to say wonderful talk. Oh, thank you. Um, and um, thank you so much. Uh, um, so yeah, I think I think we're we're all set. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Well, let let me add my final comment, which is okay. sorry about the technical meltdown in the beginning. I didn't know the thing <laughs> wasn't advancing. Uh, you know, that's why they don't do live yeah. TV anymore. I guess. <laughs> uh, Paul, maybe we could um, send the the uh, the slides to the audience members. Would that be okay? Um, I could, yeah. Um, if you can figure out how to do that, I could pull some of the pictures out. We could just make yeah. maybe a photo album from things yeah. we we're talking about today and people could scroll through them at their leisure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. okay, I'll do that tonight. I'll send it to you tonight, Omar. It's going to be okay. a big upload, but I'll send it to you tonight. <laughs> That's totally fine. Um, I'm also going to send the recording of the of the event to everyone. So we'll send it all together. Okay. This is probably a good place for me to say this is a really spectacularly beautiful book. So, so I appreciate you, know, you saying that. If you have any went, desire to own this book, you should look at these photos. I, I went through hell to get it to look the way it does. So mm. I appreciate you saying that. The guy, um, it, not all designers are created equal. And the guy who handled no. the technical <laughs> aspect of design 
absolutely a design ninja, like a virtuoso, a magician, like I've never <laughs> seen. <laughs> That's so great to hear. Thank you so much, Paul. We really, really appreciate thank you, you coming back and talking about this very important topic. And thank you so much, Lauren, for, for acting as moderate, moderator this evening as My well. My pleasure. Again, uh, and, th and, uh, and I, will send, I will send those pictures out so people won't be flying as blind. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us, and have a great evening. Uh, give your pets an uh, extra hug this evening. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.